there's no no limited warfare option when it comes to open conflict with North Korea. We're talking uh, months uh, of, of fighting. You're going to see large amounts of artillery, large amounts of, of munitions dropped from uh, aircraft from B-52s, B-1s, B-2s. Uh, you're going to see a, a shelling of the terrain on the Korean Peninsula uh, that you only see in the movies from World War II and the Korean War. This is a very brutal, very deadly regime. In the event of a military conflict on the Korean Peninsula, we have a situation where we could potentially be talking about the second, third, and 11th largest economies in the world engaged in a military conflict. The scale of fighting will, will be greater than anything we've seen around the world since the Korean War, not just on the Korean Peninsula. I think that there is a general misperception uh, among the American public, as well as among many of my colleagues here on the Hill, as well as I believe with the President of the United States, that there's some sort of limited uh, uh, warfare that can occur with regards to North Korea that would be, you know, a surgical strike or uh, uh, um, a bloody nose attack that would not result in mass casualties. And that's simply not true. Given the fact that there is a 1.2 million man army, uh, some 6,500 armored uh, vehicles, tanks, uh, some 12,000 artillery pieces, uh, chemical weapons, some 5,000 tons of chemical weapons, the amount of blood and treasure that will be expended uh, if war resumes on the Korean Peninsula uh, will be on a scale that we have not seen since the Korean War, since the, the cessation of hostilities in 1953. From the very beginning, North Korea would likely fire chemical weapons potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands of rounds. We're talking about 25 million people in Seoul from all around the world, not just Korean citizens, uh, a possible 100,000 dead within the first few days and 10,000 a day after that from just a conventional attack. I, I, I don't think there needs to be any other reason to be concerned about this than even just that alone. And then the U.S. president, President Trump, would have to decide how does he respond to that kind of thing. It has been waiting uh, for the right conditions in the past uh, 65 years. Uh, and at some point, uh, when it deems it has the advantageous position, or when it has no other option, it may very well attack South Korea, seeking to unify the peninsula under the northern regime's control uh, for one single purpose, and that is uh, to ensure the survival of the Kim family regime. According to our commanders in Korea, they could fire something in the neighborhood of 500,000 artillery rounds, shells and rockets within the first hour and continue that pace for probably several hours. South Korea would of course retaliate using their artillery to try to suppress the North Korean artillery fire. And so they would be firing into Pyongyang just as North Korea would be firing into Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Unfortunately, I believe that North Korea would be more likely to actually use biological weapons than nuclear weapons. One individual or a couple of individuals could deliver a strategic level attack on a city, a densely populated area, and expose tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands or over a million people to lethal doses of biological weapons. They're so potent that one or two people with less than a kilogram, for example, of anthrax and a sprayer, a backpack sprayer, could deliver over a million doses, lethal doses of, of anthrax and kill tens of thousands or even over 100,000 people in, in just one attack. In fact, I think that a military strike will only reinforce the belief among North Koreans that they need nuclear weapons to make sure that they maintain their sovereignty and their independence of action. In the historical literature, we talked about a concept called use it or lose it. As soon as we start attacking North Korea in a way where they could lose their weapons, they will be tempted to use them. So if we want to destroy his nuclear weapons, he may well start using them so that he can get some utility from them. And that's an outcome we really don't want. I think most people would say that peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula uh, is the preferred way of going about this. But I think that North Korea's ambitions 
um, are fundamentally at odds with U.S. policy and South Korea's policy. What I learned on the ground uh, talking to both military and civilian leaders is that Kim Jong-un is not someone who is simply going to disappear. You can't buy him off. You, you know, he, he is there to stay and, and he is um, uh, determined to uh, uh, retaliate in an overwhelming way with whatever um, uh, weapons he has at his disposal. We have to understand that trying to take a humanitarian attack with them isn't going to get us very far. We've got to be prepared to show them strength for them to respect us. I would argue that we still have a quite a bit of runway to try to shape the way he approaches the nuclear weapons program. I think that sanctions have never been tougher. Um, there are internal stresses in the regime as the sanctions take hold, and the diplomatic isolation will continue to damage the regime's ability to gain hard currency for its weapons programs. Now, I think we owe it to ourselves and to our allies and for global peace um, to let the maximum pressure work its way on North Korea.